Hey guys, Cam back here in the uh, in the Battler workshop. Well, today we're going to get stuck into preparing our sand for our moulding up of the uh, of the patterns that I've made up, and we're going to be using some green sand that I uh, I had uh, well, I bought home when we when we closed up our, our foundry. We, we we had a around about a ton of green sand that we would be using um, during our moulding sessions. Um, we used to do an awful lot of moulding, an awful lot of casting in that uh, in that foundry, both myself and Ian. Um, I'm going to be using a technique that I, I used when I first started casting back in the early 90s. And uh, originally I used to mould sand with, uh, with my hands and my feet, and that got very laborious and very tiring. So I came up with a very, very simple way of mulling the sand using an item that I think everybody has in their home. And it did make uh, life an awful lot easier, and you can mull up very large batches of sand very very quickly so we'll show you how we're going to go about doing that um, the next video we'll have a look at the patterns and I did break one of my cardinal rules in pattern making and it's caused me an awful lot of angst um, we've got it sorted out now but I'll show you what I did and what I should have done so we'll have a look at that uh, in the following videos as we go through um, talking about mullers when we were running the foundry we had uh, four mullers I had uh, we had uh, two small batch mullers one for green sand one for petrobon sand or k-bon sand as we called it it was our, uh, our recipe that uh, was developed in one of the universities in uh, in America and it mimics petrobon but an awful lot cheaper and it's something that you can continually rejuvenate yourself so we had a number of mullers um, the bigger mullers was a we, we did have a large roller muller and we also had a large paddle muller that, uh, that was used for the uh, for the cast iron um, sand, which, which, which had the coal dust in it. And we could put through fairly large quantities of sand and, and mull it up fairly, fairly quickly. But I'll take you out and I'll show you the two small batch mullers that, uh, that I've kept um, in various states of disarray, but um, at a later stage I'll get them fixed up and get them back into action. Now it's funny I'm doing casting again. <laughs> I was at that foundry for five, six years, and uh, it took up an awful lot of my time. So it wasn't uh, a full-time job for me, it was a part-time job. I still had my, my, my full-time job, but after work, I'd go down to the down to the block, and uh, we'd prepare the sand, and throughout the week, we'd ram up the moulds, and then on the weekend, we'd do the casting, and then on the first day of the week, we'd come back, we'd break up all the, uh, the moulds and see what we got, and uh, learn from our mistakes. And, uh, and we got pretty good, I think, um, towards the end. But I can tell you it became a very, very laborious job. And uh, what was something that I really looked forward to in the early days when I first started casting, it was uh, interesting, it was fun, it was uh, changing the shape of metal into something that you wanted to use for something else. Uh, it, was, it was great. At the end, it was something that I absolutely hated. I absolutely loathed it and I never wanted to do it again. But here I am, never say never, and uh, I will set up a foundry again, but on a much, much smaller scale. Um, we were running um, four furnaces, um, four furnaces if you count the cupola that we had, but uh, we had a big pit, pit furnace. We could do around about 100 kilo of aluminium. In our cast iron furnace, we could, uh, we could put out uh, fit around 50 kilos each pour. And the smaller, smaller run furnaces we could do uh, you know, up to around 20, 25 kilo of, uh, of bronze. As I said, I've kept some of the components out of that. Why? When I said I'll never go back to it again, I don't know, but I did. So uh, as I said, I'll, I'll set it up a lot, lot smaller and uh, make, it a, make it a lot more fun than what it, uh, it was in the end. And it's funny, you guys, that uh, might think that I've got a great hobby, I'd like to make that a permanent job. If you can do that, good luck to you. But I can tell you when that job has to start paying the mortgage, the bills, the school fees, put the food on the table, uh, it becomes a totally different story. So if you are contemplating, thinking, yep, I'm gonna make my hobby into a full-time job and I'm gonna kill the world, really look at it and think about it and do the numbers before you go into it. I was very close to doing that with the foundry. Uh, I'm glad I didn't. Um, a lot of other issues that you deal with when you are running a business like that, and I certainly ran my own design business for, for quite a number of years, is um, customers. <laughs> You'll get that 10% that of the customer base that just makes life 
absolutely unbearable. Uh, in the foundry game, you'll get patterns that you can't work with, that you've got to spend time fixing. You'll get patterns where people haven't looked at how they're going to be moulded, how they're going to pour, how they're going to shrink. And uh, you might have to do the same pattern three or four times before you finally got a decent job out of it. And, and there was a cost that was added to that, and then you'd be arguing about the cost, and you'd be trying to chase money. It, uh, it did get very, very wearing. So if you do have a hobby and you think, great, I'm going to turn that into a business, be very, very careful and, uh, and have a second think about it. If you can do it, hats off to you. But uh, it, uh, it can be a, a very, very um, surprising road to go down and <laughs> not in a nice way. All right, guys, I'll take you out. I'll show you the remnants of what I've got of those small batch mowers and uh, then we'll have a look at the sand that we're actually going to be working with. All right, guys, I'll see you in a tick. Well, I did say that in a bit of disarray, but uh, I've got the drum on this one turned upside down and I've got the, the roller and plow assembly um, in the shed. But uh, this is the one I use for the green sand and then we've got an old cement mixer that, uh, that we did a conversion on and uh, that was for our, uh, for our K-Bond. So these were two small batch mullers that we used to use um, when uh, we just had small amounts to do uh, rather than firing up the, uh, up the big mullers. But I'll go and see if I can find the... Um, the roll and a plow assembly for this. I've got it in the shed somewhere and we'll have a quick look at that. Okay, I won't drag it out, but uh, you can see the two mulling wheels, you can see um, the layering plow, and you can see the guide plows down the bottom there. There's one there, and uh, we had one stuck on the side of the bin. And uh, these wheels articulate about that center point, so I will be getting this uh, muller back together and get it up and going. So we'll, we'll give that a real birthday and uh, see what we can do with it. This is one of our small furnaces that we ran, so uh, that's one I took home. The bigger furnaces obviously uh, couldn't use those in a, in a backyard, so uh, I've got to give this one a, a fairly big clean. I think the last time we actually uh, melted the, uh, the, uh, the crucible out, and uh, we ended up blocking that up with, uh, with a load of aluminium, so a bit of cleaning out and a bit of uh, refurb to do on that one. This is all I've got out of the foundry. I've got some crucibles over the back, a lot of flasks over the back there. Lots of scrap bronze. I've got bins and bins of scrap bronze. There you go. There's some silicon that we used uh, used to crush up and uh, add into our iron. There's a fan casting. If you don't think you can cast very thin in aluminium, those fins are about a millimetre thick. So you've got to have your uh, your aluminium absolutely perfect to do something like that. Some of the tools, but um, yeah, got stuff scattered all over the place. All right, let's get out and uh, let's have a look at our sand and uh, we'll start some mulling. All right, guys, let's have a little bit of a look at what we're going to use for uh, molding up this uh, this pattern for the uh, for the jib crane. I've got two buckets of green sand that was left over from our foundry. Um, this is from about a ton of sand that we used to run uh, when we were uh, in our heyday, I guess. Um, one thing I don't know about this sand is whether it's got coal dust in it. Now, we use coal dust in green sand uh, to create a gas front. It burns when the cast iron hits it, creates a gas front, cushions that cast iron against the sand face and stops that, uh, that cast iron burning into the sand and giving you those, those cruddy looking uh, castings that you'll often see um, with the poor quality. Um, if you try and run coal dust with aluminium, it's a lot less dense than the uh, than the cast iron. Uh, it'll gas and uh, it will create blowholes. But uh, certainly a, a must when you're using cast iron. And as I said, we we're fairly pedantic about trying to keep those two, or we did keep those two green sand mixes apart. Um, the other mix we used to use, and I opened this up only yesterday, was this stuff here. We call this K-Bond. And it's... Uh, well, I reckon it's better than than, um, than Petrobond, but this is beautiful sand to work with. For doing the, the non-ferrous materials, the aluminium and the bronzes, the finish that you would get out of this was just magnificent. Um, you could put a thumbprint on the pattern, ram it up, and cast it, and you can see a shadow of that thumbprint out of the sand. The detail was just uh, phenomenal. Um, this K-Bond is made up using bentone, which is an activated bentonite, which is used in uh, 
oil thickness and paint thickness. Um, we mix that with, uh, with obviously with the sand, uh, two stroke oil, and we use uh, isopropyl alcohol as the activator. It's, um, so as I said, 10 years ago, we mold this up and it is good as it is 10 years ago to use today. Beautiful sand. Beautiful sand to mull too. You could, uh, when, you, when you stopped the muller, the sand started moving. It was almost like it was alive. Uh, it was beautiful stuff to ram with as well. But it uh, gave uh, very, very high quality castings. The other sands that we used as well were the, um, were the core sands. So we used uh, sodium silicate as, a, as, a, as an activator for cores, but uh, later on down the track we started using the chemical type sands and uh, they tend to be a lot easier to use than uh, the sodium silicate. You could um, mix the strength that you particularly wanted for that particular core, which made them a lot easier to get out of the castings when, uh, when you were finished. Um, with the green sand we mix um, uh, a bentonite clay with that. And I have bought some bentonite clay that I'm going to use for this and uh, we'll add some water and the muller we'll show you what we're going to use as a muller and as I said everyone at home will probably have one of these mullers that they can use and they make the job so much easier and when I first started doing my foundry work in my backyard back in the 90s uh, I did all my mulling by hand and with feet and uh, it got very laborious until I came across this little system which made life an awful lot easier so that's what we're going to show you uh, show you today um, the other type of sand that, uh, or so I should say clay that I used to use, or we used to use at our foundry, was uh, a natural clay that we got from a quarry. And uh, this is the stuff I got out of the piles when I was uh, lifting my shed up, or lifting the workshop up. So I'll need to crush that up into a finer powder, dry it out, crush it up into a finer powder. And uh, I must admit I preferred, or well, I think we got better results using the natural clays uh, rather than using the, um, the bentonite. That you can buy commercially. All right, well, let's get this out the front, and uh, we'll show you how we're going to mold this uh, mold this green sand up. And as I said, uh, I'm not too sure it's got uh, it's got um, coal dust in it, but uh, I guess we'll find out when we cast it out. All right, guys, we'll catch you soon. Right, the first thing we need to do is lay the sand out onto a uh, onto a tarp. I used to have a big plastic sheet, an underlay sheet that used to go under, uh, was used for uh, the under the side of slabs, concrete slabs, uh, that I bought down at my local uh, hardware store. But we're going to lay the sand out first, and then we're going to set the muller up to actually break that sand up and uh, and get rid of all the clumps.
there is pretty good. Put a couple of lumps in it, so that'll come out. Well, it's a lot better than what it was. All right, let's get mixing. Right guys, first thing I'm going to do is uh, mix some of this uh, benthamite powder in through the sand. Can't need a lot. There will be, already be some uh, clay, natural clays in the sand. And we're just going to rake. We just rake it through. Let's see how the condition is coming up with it. Right. Let's grab some water. This is all done by feel, how much water we add, how much bentonite that we're going to add. She comes up um, when we do start my land. All right, guys, we're back in the tick. Yep. Now, the very important thing is always use a tarp. You can see on my boots how it's just sticking to my boots. If you don't use a tarp and you do this on the driveway on concrete, it will stick and it's an absolute muck of a job to try and get out. Also, when you're using the car as your muller and you're rolling over the top, as I did once, the sand stuck to the tyres about two inches thick and you go driving off down the road and it's flicking off everywhere and the neighbours are giving you rather funny looks. So uh, always use a tarp or some sort of plastic as a barrier between the concrete and the tyres on the uh, on the muller. Alright, so what I'm going to do now, I haven't added much more bentonite to that, maybe another half a handful. So about a handful and a half is what we've added to that. And just flip this over. And what we're doing here is actually mimicking what a muller does. So what a muller does, not only does it bring the sand into the muller wheels, but it also layers the sand as it's moving through with the ploughs. And all we're doing here is we're layering it just by flipping it over on the, uh, on the tarp. So I'm fairly happy with Still find bits of element in a minute. I'm fairly happy with the uh, consistency of that. That's quite good. But it really needs to be finished off with a muller wheel. That's what we're going to use the, uh, the car for. Now the idea of the mulling wheel is that it actually squeezes or forces the sand grains into the clay. The idea is you want to try and coat every bit of sand you've got with clay so you don't get break away at the edges. Uh, when you're either pulling the pattern out or when you're pouring that molten metal in. So we've got to try and make sure that's very consistent all the way through. Alright, so uh, I'll get the tarp folded up. I'll get Mum's uh, muller on the go. She doesn't know I'm using it at the moment. <laughs> she's probably the fit if she saw me doing this. And uh, I used to get rather strange looks from my neighbours where I used to live when I started doing this. Wondering what the hell is he doing this time. But it works quite well. All right, we'll get that folded over and uh, we'll bring you back and we'll uh, mull it out.
nice and good. Let's have a look at the other. Yeah, look. That is beautiful. That is wonderful. I'm really happy with that consistency. It's not too dry. It's not too wet. Alright. I'll break this up again and give it one more go with a muller. And I reckon that'll be it. surprised at how good the condition of this sand is. You can sort of see over the distance there just how that clay sticks to the sticks to the concrete and it's absolute mongrel to try and get off. So as I said, always need to use to have this barrier. As I said, it makes a mess of your tires as well. Alright, let's get that the last mile. So, an easy way to break this up rather than using the, uh, the rake is just to do this. So I've given this another mulling with the car and uh, I'm really really happy with the consistency of this. So I'll show you what it's like. And that still bits of aluminium left over. Alright, I'll show you what it's like. You see that? It takes a little bit to break that up and that's exactly how you want it. It's not wet to the palm, but it certainly holds its, its shape very well. Now my wife's holding the camera, and sweetheart, I've got a confession. Yes. <laughs> you know how I was using your car to do this mowing? Yes. I've got a lot of the clay stuck to the carpet inside the car, but I've got to try and clean out. You what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Next time you can use your own car. That's too big to be a mower. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I'll gather all this up and uh, put it in the rubbish bin, the plastic rubbish bin and then I just give it a light sprinkle with water and then I'll put a, a, a plastic uh, rubbish liner over the top just to hold it and that'll hold that for weeks so that'll be ready for when we want to do our, our moulding and our casting Alright guys We'll see you soon I'm going to clean this car out <laughs> right. Okay we've got this binned up this sand is just beautifully conditioned. It's really lightweight and fluffy, yet holds its shape very well and has some really good green strength in it. So that's how you want your green sand to be if you're doing any sort of casting. As I said, the big unknown is how we've got coal dust in it. Well, I guess we'll find out, won't we? 
All right, so as I said, I'm just gonna lay a little bit of, um, sprinkle a bit of water on top of this, put a plastic bin liner over the top, and then put the lid on, and that'll last for, uh, for quite a long time, at least until we're ready to, uh, to start rounding up our molds. All right, guys, I'll see you soon.